I continue to draw from what I've mentioned several times on different occasions the last number of weeks of what Brother Buddy said concerning not being ignorant of Satan's devices. One of the things we know about Satan is that he is never doing anything but going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's all he exists for. So it is we need to know about his devices, how he functions to get us to sin. That ought to again remind us, and we need to be reminded of it, that the only thing to keep you out of heaven, to keep any person out of heaven, is sin. Unforgiven sin. It may be that people don't like this or like that about you or whatever there may be about you, but if it's not sinful, you're going to heaven. And that's important to understand. We don't want to make a greater standard than what God has set as to who goes to heaven and who doesn't. And the person whose sins are forgiven and dies with his sins forgiven is the person that's going to heaven and nobody else. And that's very important. And of course, I keep that in the scope of people who are accountable to God. So this particular device is one that probably is used by Satan about as much as any. And that is allowing our fellow man, sometimes our own families, sometimes our friends, and after this morning's lesson we'll put that in quote, and sometimes we don't have to put it in quote. Not allowing others to provoke us to sin. Not allowing others to provoke us to transgress God's will. In keeping with His promise to deliver the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt, after a marvelous and great show, demonstration of His power over Egypt and Pharaoh, God then, as the scripture might say, with a mighty outstretched arm delivered the people from slavery. When to use New Testament terminology, when they all passed under the cloud and all passed through the sea on dry ground. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 4. Well, we find them wandering in the wilderness. And if they had been faithful, they would have very quickly have gotten into the land of promise. But when God told them to go up and possess the land, they let the giants of the land cause them to disobey Him. And God said, then you're going to wander some 40 years until all these people have died. When you know the whole story, then everybody 20 years old and upward, but Joshua and Caleb died in the wilderness wandering. No matter how many good things did for them, as they wandered in the wilderness, the children of Israel continued to sin against God. And it's one of these occasions that I would like to use this afternoon to emphasize one of Satan's devices to use others to provoke us to transgress God's will. You'll remember from your Old Testament studies that when the children of Israel came to Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin and there was no water to be found there that wasn't the first time that happened but we're talking about that given occasion well guess what the children of Israel did once again then they proved their unfaithfulness to God they hadn't really learned much at all and they began to murmur against God himself and it was at that time and that particular place that you'll remember that God commanded Moses to speak to a rock in order to provide water for the people. I say again that this wasn't the first occasion where the people didn't have water. And on another occasion, God had told Moses to strike a rock to provide them water. But in this occasion, at Kadesh in the desert of Zin, in Moses' anger at the long time continued rebelliousness of these people who would not learn to trust God. Moses vented his anger and he declared to Israel, Here now, you rebels, must we, must we fetch you water 
out of this rock. And he struck it. Numbers 20 and 10. Then as Moses is going back over these events, just before the children of Israel are led by Joshua to go and possess the land of Canaan, book of Deuteronomy, which Deuteronomy means a restatement of the law, we find that that is brought back up by none other than Moses himself. Because of his sin then in striking the rock and not speaking to it as God commanded, here is what Moses said, or here's what was said by God to Moses in Numbers 20 and 12, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I'm giving them. I've tried to try to sit down and think for a little bit to say what disappointment that must have been to Moses. You know, this is, he, he was born into Egypt. He gave up all that Egypt had to offer as a prince of Egypt, one of the greatest, if not the greatest country in wealth and knowledge in the whole world. And he went 40 long years of being a shepherd, down the land of Midian. And then he came back as God directed him, as called in the burning bush, to go back and to be the deliverer of the children of Israel. And then after all of the plagues of Egypt and being delivered from Egypt through the Dead Sea, he's with them for 40 more years. And yet he's not able to go into the land of promise which every Jew yearned to see. Remember, they had known about this from the days of Abraham before there ever was a people of Israel. God renewed the land promise to Isaac and Jacob, son and grandson of Abraham. Hundreds of years had gone by since Abraham had originally been told that through thy seed all nations of the earth will be blessed and that he would uh, cause a great country to develop and a great people to develop that you couldn't number by the sands of the seashore or the stars of heaven. And they all had this talk to them over hundreds of years. And now Moses, having done this, and nobody compares to him and his loyalty to God. And now because he did not do as God commanded in speaking to the rock, but he struck it, then God says, you can't go over. You can't go over. He did allow him to go up on Mount Nebo and see the land, but he would not let him go over. I pause here and point out that that shows you that Satan can even inflict upon the greatest of men uh, trouble. Moses let the people get to him. After all these years, his patience wore thin. Do you think that could happen to you or me? Well, of course it could. Do you think Satan knows that? Certainly. There were at least three occasions during the speaking of Moses that we have as the book of Deuteronomy, the restatement of the law before the children of Israel went over to possess the land. Deuteronomy 137, 3, 26 through 27, chapter 421. And it's interesting how it's worded there because the scripture brings out that Moses blamed the people for his being banned from the promised land. Listen to him in Deuteronomy 4, 21 and 22. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes because of you and swear that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan. But ye shall go over and possess that good land. Well, does that mean Moses is saying God was unfair to me and unjust? Because of you, I'm not able to go over? In effect, remember what I said earlier about this lesson as far as we're not ignorant of Satan's devices to you, the words of the inspired Apostle Paul. What Moses is saying is simply because of your rebelliousness, your sinfulness, and you're becoming a tool of Satan, he got to me. 
I wonder how many husbands are being held because their ungodly wife got to them or vice versa. Or I wonder how many godly people did very well till their children got old enough to be teenagers and they did things sinful and it embarrassed their parents that we could be so godly, dedicated, and faithful in the church. And now our kids have embarrassed us to death and their unruliness and their rebelliousness and their sinfulness. And we're ashamed of the whole thing and, and we just walk off and go somewhere else. You start looking for a place where nobody will know you, you see. I know that happened. So your children, those whom you brought into the world and you love, can cause you to go to hell. But in every case here, it's because we allow it to happen. We let our attachments to things, and usually an emotional attachment, cause us to sin. Herein, this passage is found the point that we desire to make in this study. And we ought to be aware of it. Satan's aware of it. He's aware of it in your own life. He knows what you're attached to. He knows our every weak point. He knows how to manipulate it. That's all he does. If you want to look at it, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days out of the year, that's all he does. In given situations, and under certain circumstances, one can be moved to transgress God's will by other people. Because those other people, by their own lack of faith and rebelliousness, thus their conduct, they've created situations and circumstances that bears on you. And if you don't realize that device about Satan... You're going to be overcome by it. I think sometimes of the account of our Lord's of the prodigal son. Why didn't the father say, I've been a miserable failure? He's got two sons. Now that's representing the older brother, remember. The elder brother represented the Jews who were so upset because the Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, to be saved. The younger brother who receives inheritance and wasted in riotous living represents then the Gentiles, as you read up in Romans 1, how they, denied, uh, how they desired not to retain God their knowledge and went off after all these other things. And thus, uh, when the gospel comes to the, them, they would many other repent. Remember how many times uh, Paul would carry the gospel to the Jews in a certain community and they would rebel against it? He'd say, yea, henceforth we turn to the Gentiles. That's the idea. And they will receive it, Paul said at one time. Well, why didn't the father say, I've got one son? No, he acted when the prodigal son repented and came back home. He was all upset. Well, that's the way the Jews were. But then here's the other son who has gone off and done what he's done. Now comes back home, nothing. Why didn't the father say, I went wrong somewhere? I messed up somewhere. May I remind you the father in this account of the prodigal son is God. And God does not mess up. But God created you and me and all other normal human beings as free moral agents. And the best of examples in teaching, the best training does not overrule one's free moral agency. I know that as much as anything from the very beginning of the Bible because of Cain. But more than that, I know it because of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created by God and schooled by God and taught by God and trained by God. What did they do? Gave them one commandment. And they broke it. Now the way men think, well, there must be something wrong with that father if you couldn't train him to keep one little old commandment wasn't God's fault. It was their free moral agency. But God gave them their free moral agency. You know why He gave it to them? He wouldn't be a loving God if He hadn't. One of the greatest testimonies of God's love for mankind is He didn't make us robots. He created us to make choices by our own thinking, 
study, and our own will. So that we can choose to serve God or choose not to. God wants us to serve Him because we desire to serve Him because He is God and all that that means. So no wonder Adam and Eve sinned. Cain sinned and finally all men sinned. Come short of the glory of God. All men transgress His law. So I want to say to you at this point regarding this part of our lesson to all of you who are just starting your families. If you don't think you can be embarrassed and made ashamed by people in your own family. Just hang around a while and hide and watch. They don't have to always sin. But they can just embarrass you all sorts of reasons. They can embarrass you to where later on you get over it and tell it as a funny. But the point is, uh, Satan knows how to use your mom and daddy, how to use you, or how to use your children or your other members of the family or your best friends to get you to transgress God's will. I've often wondered over the years about, about preachers who for a while, at least as much as people could tell, bore the fruit of righteousness and their ability to preach and debate and to write and to live godly lives. Then all of a sudden, you find them, and it's really not all of a sudden, it's just the way it appears to you, that they leave God they get off over into something that's contrary to the will of heaven. Well, what did they do? What did they not do? I know for a fact that some have gone off into false doctrine because they felt they were mistreated by the church. I did all I could. I preached the truth. I worked with them for years. And look how they treated me. And they simply say, I'm just not going to put myself through that anymore. And they start softening up the doctrine. And they start looking at these other folks. And well, after all, uh, God is patient with all of us. And none of us are perfect. And we all make mistakes. Uh, and yet among the people that should be those battling all sorts of liberalism and error, here the way they operate. So why wouldn't he... Why wouldn't he tolerate and put up with these folks over here on the left side of things, teaching doctrines that loose us for what God binds on us? He puts up with us, doesn't he? And I've seen as much sin among us as I've seen over here among everybody else. So I just loosen the doctrine. After all, the liberals are paying no telling what kind of money, and they don't pay it over here. And Why shouldn't I have some of that? I'm serving God. That's the way it works in people's minds. Or you've got somebody in the church, not a preacher, and here I've given all my life working here in this congregation. And now they treat me this way. And they throw up their hands and walk off to an easier course. One of Satan's devices. And if you don't know there about yourself, you may be already on that road. That's just the way it works. What you have to tell yourself, regardless of what happens to me, good or bad, Regardless of what other people do to me, good or bad, it doesn't change God or His will. Especially when I read from Jesus saying that to live faithful to me, you have a cross to bear. Well, doesn't that not tell us that there's going to be hardship along the way? And then Paul just comes right out and says it. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What do you expect? Are we taught also that we're to count the cost of discipleship? If I'm going to be faithful to the Lord, do I want to become a Christian if I am unwilling to take the slings and arrows of life's outrageous fortune, as Shakespeare would say it? And a lot of us aren't. You know, probably when I started preaching, I had as much zeal to be a preacher as anybody, but I was just as naive as the world is long. You know what I actually thought as an 18, 19, 20 year old preacher? I thought if you were a member of the Church of Christ, you were honest. You were dedicated to studying your Bible every day and praying. You were going to be obedient to the elders and that the elders were going to be qualified or they wouldn't be elders. And that as elders, they would serve God according to what God called them to do. That the deacons were really deacons 
in that they were kicking up their heels fast to get around to carry out the work that was done, that all the Bible school teachers were loyal and faithful, that every member was hungry and thirsting after righteousness, that they all wanted to do right, and you know they would do right at the drop of a hat and they'd drop it. How long do you think it took me to get the awfulest, coldest bucket of water dumped over my head and wake me up to reality? My first full-time work. Hey, there are those that go around as Christians. They don't even know what a Christian is. You know what's wrong a lot in the Lord's church? you got people in it who are there and part of it for the same reason that people are Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterians and Roman Catholic. That's what they've always been exposed to and nothing else. And they would feel odd going anywhere else. <laughs> They're not convicted of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They're there because that's where mom and daddy went and I feel a need to do something. So I'm there. Don't you know that's Satan's devices that works on you? Because when, when you get hit with that and it finally dawns on you, well, this is not what I thought it was. And you begin to play another tune. These aren't radical, outlandish things. We all know that if we're honest with our own minds saying, well, well I, I just had it. No, it's the people that stay with it. If it happened to Moses and this thing was written aforetime for your learning and my learning, Romans 15, 4, then I ought to learn from it. That's why it's there. Those who by their sinful conduct provoke others to sin are responsible for their part in influencing somebody else to sin. But that doesn't mean I didn't have the responsibility to stand up against them and realize what was going on and not sin myself. And that's where Moses dropped the ball. It doesn't mean he shouldn't become angry at them. I wish we could get over this business of any kind of anger being sinful itself. How could you deal with those people on that day and not be angry with them? That had years upon years of the time they were in Egypt and the way that God brought them out of Egypt, just that alone was enough to say, God will take care of you. We have something like Matthew 6.33 that says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How long does it take people to learn that? But evidently, a lot of the children of Israel never did learn it. So you have the prohibition found in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Exodus 23.2. Why is that there? Because it's easier to do wrong when you can do it with other people doing wrong. You might not do wrong if it's left up to you, but you get with a crowd that's no bigger than the size of this people here, this, this gathering. And if they all do the same thing, it's easy for you to go right along with them. Have you ever used yourself or having reared children have you ever heard them when they ask you to go somewhere or to do something or be with somebody and you say no you can't go or no you can't do that and one of the retorts from them is everybody else is doing it that seems to always be a great way for Satan to try to work his, his business whether people's actions anger one to the point of sitting, as in the case of Moses, or they go along with the majority to sin, because it's easier to sin when everyone else is doing it, then nevertheless it brings us to the decision to break God's will. What we must prove to God about our faith in Him and His system of salvation is that no matter the situations and circumstances created by sinful people, we will not permit ourselves to break God's law. Now you go down to Christian living day by day by day by day till you die. The foregoing should help every one of us to understand at least one reason why God declared to the Lord's church in the city of Ephesus in Asia, and He did so through the inspired apostle Paul, 
Be ye angry and sin not. Ephesians 4.26. You know, you could say that about a number of things. God gave us our emotions. Be happy and sin not. Be sad and sin not. You see, it fits all the way there. It's just that anger is usually when we're upset at what somebody personally did to me and I'm going to get back at them. But you can be so happy about things you let your guard down and you plunge yourself off into something everybody else is doing and it's wrong. It's sinful. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Why is that passage important? Because it means there's always something going on that if you allow it, it'll pull you away. It'll cause you to go ahead and sin. By their persistence in sin, some of my brethren have long been adept and highly skilled at provoking godly brethren to anger. And be that as it may, we dare not allow such brethren to cause us to sin in the similitude of Moses. For such a great man could sin as he did, and for the reason that he did, I ask again as I did earlier, what about us? Do you remember how God described the character of Moses? Listen to Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That's a marvelous statement. But he sinned. And he sinned because he allowed others to make him angry. He lost control of himself. And he violated the will of heaven. Something has to make you do what you know is wrong. And in our study, we would do well to remember the admonition of the Apostle Paul near the end of the letter he wrote to the church at Rome. As I quoted at the beginning of this sermon... <laughs> Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Then the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth much the same thing. And we've already referred to this passage of scripture in the beginning of the lesson. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat that same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. To the intent, listen to it, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Did you notice in the song a moment ago that we um, read, led us in about the water, the water of life? Did you notice he said the rock that was stricken for me? Well, earlier, of course, from the account that we have where Moses sinned, he was commanded to strike the rock. Now Moses sinned when he struck the rock the second time, another time and place in Kadesh. But God still gave him water. So either case, the rock that was smitten for me. Well, who ultimately was that rock? Why, well, it was Jesus Christ. He who had the water of life. So you see, Moses not only sinned as a person being told to do something a certain way and he didn't do it. But Moses also violated the type that he was. For he's a type of the Christ. And that made it even worse, that he got it selected in the type of character we just read that God view him, viewed him as having, and that he violated that time. Thus, his sin was not only his personal obedience to God, but was a sin of violating the very type of Christ that Moses was. So we should recognize that this Old Testament account was written for your spiritual benefit and for mine. For all those who are Christians. We know this because of how the Holy Spirit had Paul to use this account from the Old Testament in the New Testament writing. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so on. Notice 
And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that rock. That spiritual rock. That followed them. See Christ came later. And that rock was Christ. We don't learn that about all of this in the Old Testament. And we learn it by reading the New Testament. And again it comes to mind. That the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. With the proper application made. Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Don't let people and their conduct cause you to lose your self-control and transgress God's will. Be angry and sin not means be angry without transgressing God's will. Be happy without transgressing God's will. Be sad, but don't let it cause you to violate the will of heaven. Moses was angry. And he transgressed God's will. Moses could have been angry and spoken of the rock. I fail to see how a faithful person could have escaped being angry at these people. When your children, and you do love them, don't you? But when your children persist in doing something you've told them not to do or leaving undone something you expect them to do, and you know they know better, you still love them. But does that preclude your disciplining them to show them the importance of obeying mom and dad? The world today does not see things that way, but uh, we're not of the world. We are motivated and guided by the truth of God's dear Son. Father, He prayed, sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth. And in that way, we keep control of ourselves. And we do what needs to be done. No matter what our grown sons and daughters do, or mom and daddy do or don't do, or whoever it may be, we don't let them become a tool of Satan to get us to transgress his will. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, it'd be wonderful before you leave here, you'd be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church Jesus built. You can do that by believing with all your heart Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, <coughs> repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. That's God's plan of salvation. Are you going to let your parents, because they didn't believe it, keep you out of what you know the Bible to teach? Or because your children won't do what you know the Bible says, you're going to have to defend them in it? And thus lose your soul because they have, by your defense of that which is indefensible, caused you to sin. We can't do things like that. We have to do what we know is right. Because right's the only thing that's going to lead us to heaven. As a child of God, when you sin, you can repent, can't you? Certainly, and it's a command that we do so. And if you commanded it, we can. So we repent of our sins and confess our sins and pray God for forgiveness according to God's second law of pardon. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ to become a Christian or to renew your life? You'll have to answer that question. Don't let Satan lead you another direction when you know what the answer really ought to be. If you need to come to Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing this song.